Hi, everyone. I'm Pavel Zakharov. Uh, I'm working here at Exynos. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk to you about the data lake we at the Data Warehouse team are building. Uh, we'll discuss uh, the main building blocks of our solution, uh, about reasons behind using several uh, of the, those, these blocks, and maybe a little bit about the implementation and about several issues we've encountered along the way. So without further ado, let's go on. On this slide, uh, you see a uh, very high-level architecture of the existing uh, platform. So at the beating heart of our system is Vertica. Uh, it's a popular MPP uh, with familiar SQL interface. It's robust, that is performant. Uh, everybody knows it. It works great. Uh, we use uh, mostly our custom ETL tools to get the data from sources to Vertica and some legacy tools as well. I'm not discussing them as, at all. Uh, we also have a data hub which serves, uh, provides a glimpse to the data lineage uh, of everything that we're loading. And uh, aside from Vertica, we also have an instance of Postgres, which mostly serves for operational uh, analytics and copies more, several uh, data structures from Vertica. Uh, so everything you see here is being orchestrated by Argo workflow. Maybe someone heard about it. It's a Kubernetes orchestration tool. Orchestration tool. Uh, everything seems just fine on the previous slide, so uh, why the need to build something more? Uh, why introduce more complexity? Well, the first factor is cost. Uh, Vertic is being licensed by the amount of data stored, uh, which means that if you want to in increase your storage size, you have to not only uh, add, add additional hardware, uh, which is sometimes simple, but you also have to, have to buy additional license, which can be quite expensive depending on the size of the data uh, you want to add to your cluster. Uh, second issue is scalability. Uh, you see, if you're not using Vertica in Eon mode, uh, I will talk about it a little bit later. Uh, if you're using Vertica in enterprise mode, uh, you only can upgrade uh, storage and compute in sync. Uh, which means that, again, if you want to add more storage, you have to buy additional nodes, uh, which have more processing power as well. But it's going to run up the price pretty damn quickly, uh, because at least in my practice, uh, storage requirements typically grow uh, much faster than compute requirements. Uh, so again, uh, these two being in sync is an issue, an issue of scalability and issue of cost. Uh, there's also a question of machine learning. Uh, so as you can imagine, a typical uh, data scientist or machine learning uh, workflow uh, may look like this. Uh, a person goes uh, to some kind of data store, uh, gets a data sample uh, to his machine, uh, and uh, does some magic with it. And that's it. Uh, so see here, we basically encounter a limitation of just a single machine, be that uh, a single laptop, or maybe a desktop. It may be powerful, but it's just one machine. We can also use some kind of virtual machine on prem and on cloud, uh, but it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't scale horizontally at all. So that can be a problem. There's also a problem of uh, the data set uh, because you're limited in terms of what data you can get. Uh, because of the issue uh, with cost and vertical licensing that I've discussed before, we have to be extremely selective on which data to integrate to Vertica. Uh, for a lot of cases, it doesn't make any sense to get, uh, for example, events to Vertica from our sources, uh, but for data science, it may be quite useful indeed. Uh, so potentially having all this data available for the analysis uh, for all these other subsystems and uh, to be able to run all the workflows, not just on one machine, but over the entire computational cluster could be quite beneficial. Uh, so let's introduce a little bit of complexity to the picture. And here you see the previous architecture and the new one goes here. Uh, so it's supposed to solve all our problems, all the issues I've talked about before. Uh, mostly it has to decouple compute from storage uh, to improve, increase our feature set, all while keeping the cost down. Uh, here you see that at the center, I'll try to use this. Oh, cool, it works. Uh, so here at the center you see a data storage. Uh, for the data storage, we're using an object store uh, called Mineo. Maybe some of you have used it. Uh, it's quite popular these days. Uh, every, every piece of data that's been uh, loaded to our system gets there. Uh, gets there. Uh, for compute part, we're using uh, Apache Spark. Here it is. Uh, it does all everything that we need from the compute and runs over the Kubernetes. 
Uh, we also have uh, Apache Zeppelin serving as the main entry point for data scientists, other analy analysts, uh, and for data engineers as well. Apache Zeppelin, if uh, some of you aren't familiar with it, basically is something akin to Jupyter Notebook, only more suited for engineering tasks um, and supports Spark, uh, SQL, Python, a lot of stuff. There are lots of interpreters for that. It also runs over Kubernetes. Uh, it's all been orchestrated by Airflow, and all the transformations are being achieved using uh, dbt. Uh, dbt runs uh, with Spark using Drift Server. Uh, so that's the entire picture. Uh, you may have noticed a lack of certain words in previous slides. No AWS, no GCP, no Azure. Uh, that's not a coincidence. We're not using uh, cloud-only solutions. We're going to pursue cloud agnostic approach, uh, which means that we intend to leverage uh, both cloud and on-prem infrastructure depending on our needs, all while not being tied down uh, with a single vendor and uh, their locked-in solution, and uh, while avoiding a typical convoluted price and structure of most clouds. Uh, so it means that we are avoiding uh, all the closed formats, uh, all proprietary APIs, and pursue only open source tools and formats and uh, APIs. Uh, it's, well, at least it will help us uh, to control our data fully uh, because it's all going to be on-prem and uh, also allows us to be potentially flexible because again, we can run everything on cloud if we intend to. Uh, let's start uh, discussing uh, some of the key components I've talked to you about on the slide about the architecture. And we are going to start from uh, MinIO. Uh, what MinIO is, is an object store. Uh, object storage, object store is a strategy of accessing data uh, as single units, objects. Uh, so these objects are being accessed uh, within flat address structure, unlike your typical hierarchical paradigm of files and folders. Each object has been provided with a unique identifier and some kind of metadata. Uh, all this data is being accessed uh, using typically HTTP protocol. Uh, and that's it. So basically, that's the entire definition of an object store. A lot of people are using it. Uh, most of you maybe are used to Amazon S3, and that's it. So what is S3? S3 is a simple storage service. Uh, it's an API uh, developed by Amazon, and now it's a currently uh, it's a de facto standard of transferring data in and from uh, object stores. So MinIO is fully S3 compliant. Uh, so if you have some kind of software or any subsystem that works with Amazon S3, it's going to work with MinIO. Only MinIO you can install on-premise, for example, or in the cloud if you're so inclined. Mm, on Kubernetes, on bare metal, uh, doesn't matter. It is free, uh, it's open source uh, and distributed. It scales very well horizontally uh, so and provides a lot of data protection features. Uh, I'll stop a bit and uh, describe uh, how a typical MinIO cluster looks. This one is very simple. Uh, some of the details aren't shown. I will tell you about them, but everything else is here. Uh, so a MinIO cluster uh, typically is being, it consists of nodes, uh, potentially lots of nodes. You see node N. Uh, you can have as many as you want. Nodes are being separated into uh, different uh, server, server pools. Uh, what server pool is is a collection of node, uh, nodes which serves at its own failure point. So if you have several failures of nodes or disk in one server pool, uh, it typically does not affect all the other server pools. It's also a tool uh, to achieve horizontal scalability uh, because you can, for example, add or remove um, nodes from the existing server pool, but you can add several more server pools to the cluster. Or you can, for example, decommission an old pool and add additional one instead of it. Uh, so one of the cool features uh, of MinIO is erasure coding. Erasure coding uh, basically keeps the, keeps the data safe in terms of something fails. Uh, so what it does, it uh, stripes the data, and it stripes data into it stripes objects into data in parity blocks and distributes them across disks and nodes uh, over the entire server pool. Um, with it, uh, we achieve 50% uh, uh, safety, which means that we can lose half of our disks or nodes, and the data uh, is still going to be there. Uh, MinIO uh, fully, uh, fully provides versioning and active-to-active -active replica replication of uh, specific buckets. So we can have, for example, 
the same cluster uh, replicates in one of the buckets uh, to both directions, or we can have a separate cluster, or even Amazon S3 um, with full replication to achieve data safety, for example, or for backup purposes. Um, okay, uh, we're done with Mineo, and moving on to Spark. Uh, we chosen Spark as a compute uh, solution. Yeah, it's box standards decision uh, because Spark is easy. Uh, I mean, it's an easy choice. Uh, Spark supports both Python and SQL, so it provides low barriers for entry for engineers and analysts alike. Uh, it supports everything uh, we need so far from our workloads and most of the things we expect in the future. Uh, it's scalable, uh, it's quite performant. Mm, some, some solutions are faster than Spark, but still, uh, it's fast enough. It also supports uh, several uh, resource managers, uh, which I'm going to talk to you about later. Uh, so basically, yeah, Spark was a safe choice. Uh, a little bit more difficult is choosing, choosing a resource manager for Spark. Uh, here we have Spark standalone, which nobody, as far as I know, uses in production. Maybe raise a hand if someone still does, okay. Uh, Hadoop, uh, which is Yarn, because uh, Spark have to use Yarn as resource manager, and Kubernetes. Uh, so I'll move through um, all these uh, choices, and maybe finally you'll understand why we have chosen what we have chosen. Let's start with Spark standalone, which nobody still uses. Uh, on the benefit side, uh, it's extremely easy to deploy on any kind of hardware, be that bare metal or virtual machines. And that's basically it, uh, because everything else is a downside, as far as I understand. Uh, we like fine-grained control uh, for access and authentication. Uh, there are problems with using several Spark versions on the same cluster, and we need to provide environments and Linux libraries on all nodes. Yeah, uh, we can avoid that, but especially with Python, um, Spark standalone does not support uh, running them in cluster nodes. Uh, so we're skipping this one and go into the most popular choice, uh, as I believe, Spark on Hadoop. Uh, it's good for some purposes, because first, it supports data locality. Uh, even our own benchmark showed uh, that data locality greatly improves performance compared to um, the second choice. Uh, so yeah, that's good, it's performant, it's fast. It supports Kerberos, uh, which enhances security, although I believe that some of you may not agree that it's a uh, and it's a pro. Uh, still, I had to write it here because it's an enterprise standard. Uh, and we also have an entire Hadoop stack available because Hadoop has a lot of tools, and some of which, uh, some of which can be useful for later stages of our implementation of the data lake. So let's take a look at the downsides. Well, obviously, it requires Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop is notoriously difficult to deploy and maintain, uh, at least the way I see it. Uh, so it's time consuming to deploy and configure. We need some kind of infrastructure as the code tools. Uh, and we have to keep compute and storage in sync. Uh, yes, uh, we can use a hybrid approach with uh, a separate, for example, object store, again, like MinIO, and still use the same cluster, uh, but I don't see it as a viable solution, at least for our purposes. So uh, I've cheated a little bit here, and I've listed Kerberos twice, as you can, may notice, because I don't believe that Kerberos is easy uh, to maintain and is easy to configure. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be a trouble to configure it. Uh, so it's uh, it's a problem as well. Uh, and the final uh, final downside uh, that I see of Hadoop is uh, uh, its vendor because. Uh, nobody I know at least, uh, except for very, very big companies, is using vanilla Hadoop. Uh, most people prefer an existing distribution, uh, which is currently just the Cloudera. Everything, everyone else is gone. So you have to be basically locked down to a single vendor, uh, which we don't like, so we're going further. Uh, the final player in the mix, it's Spark on Kubernetes, welcome. Uh, I'll uh, describe how it works at a very high level uh, before switching to pros and cons. So uh, what's happening here? Uh, our Spark application, uh, along with all its artifacts, dependencies, uh, in the of Python, is being assembled to a single image. Um, and Spark Submit runs a driver pod in Kubernetes cluster. So driver pod then uh, creates uh, a plan and goes to API server of Kubernetes cluster uh, to ask for resources. API server then uh, creates executor pods and notifies driver pod that they're ready. Driver pod then runs all the tasks on these executor pods. Hmm, I gotta show you them, yeah. Those are executor pods. 
And as soon as the driver pod is done, uh, so he receives commands from executor pods that all the tasks have been processed, uh, Kubernetes cluster terminates all those pods. Uh, if the executor pods need some kind of temporary storage for spills, for example, uh, uh, an empty directory is being mounted to each node at which this specific pod is being created. And of course, it's being destroyed as well. Uh, so we create the pods, uh, we terminate them, we free the up all the resources. So after the task is done, everything's gone. Uh, you may have noticed that it requires some time to run uh, executor pods and even the driver pod, so it's going to take a little bit of overhead to run each task. It may take up to 15, maybe 20 seconds. So of course, for not long running tasks, it's going to be a little bit of a problem. But for long running tasks, I don't believe uh, it's going to impact performance at all. Like 15 seconds, not a problem. So uh, going to pros and cons of this solution. Uh, we finally uh, are able to achieve what we intended from the start. We decouple compute from storage. Uh, because you can uh, run all this compute workload on any Kubernetes cluster you like. Uh, you can install Kubernetes cluster on-prem. Uh, you can go to AWS and order any KS instance. Uh, again, whatever you like. And run all your workloads there without any kind of problem. Uh, you can get your own in Minio instance. You can order additional uh, buckets, for example, from AWS. Uh, and it's going to work. You can add uh, several uh, resource pools to several pools to your Minio instance, and you can increase the storage as much as you like. Uh, even with Minio, for Minio, for example, you can add uh, additional Minio instance with cheaper disks. Uh, so you have to don't have to use necessarily SSDs, for example. You can use cheap old hard drives uh, to store the data that you don't need uh, super fast access to. So basically, it means potentially heterogeneous uh, storage. Uh, so that's all great. Uh, it's also very convenient uh, uh, to um, have images with everything integrated with them uh, because we have our own repository for all the tasks. So we can have as many images um, with different combinations of Spark versions, uh, Python interpreters, all the dependencies and libraries there. So it's very easy to test and say CD because you just take your image and do whatever you want with it. You can go and run Minikube, for example, on your laptop, and it's going to work as easy as on a big cluster. Uh, but there are still some downsides here as well, how we can avoid them. Uh, first is a lack of data locality. Without data locality, we have to concentrate on optimizing I.O. Again, in our benchmarks, it showed that uh, Hadoop uh, version with with more or less the same resources, provides uh, from 30 to 50% more performance, at least in cases we've tested, that we've tested. So we have to optimize a little bit more for that. And uh, it's also going to mean a steep learning curve for developers and uh, DevOps engineers alike, because it's Kubernetes. Uh, it may not be as straightforward as we are used to. So um, that takes a little bit of time. Still. We went on with this choice because it answers most of the questions we uh, answered most of the questions we asked uh, before we jumped into the project. Uh, another power couple of our system is DBT with Thrift. So, what's Thrift? Uh, Thrift is uh, basically a port of uh, Hive Server 2 to Spark. Uh, it allows any client to execute SQL queries um, using DBC protocol uh, on Spark. Mm. That's the definition, mm, it works. Uh, mainly we use it to um, uh, integrate with dbt. Uh, dbt uh, handles all the transformation in our transformations in our cluster. Uh, it allows uh, developers and analysts using uh, just the knowledge of SQL uh, to develop uh, transformations and deploy some analytics code uh, quite easily. And uh, to control this, we're using uh, GitLine pipelines, including deploy stage and SQL fluff as a linter. Uh, that allows us to save resources of data platform team for code review, because before the code of dbt gets to code review, uh, it, it should pass through the pipeline. So uh, it's more or less unified of, in terms of code style. And it's supposed to function at least because it wouldn't be able to deploy otherwise. So to afford all of this, uh, we pair dbt with Thrift and moving forward. Okay, an orchestrate choice. We are super boring and we have chosen Airflow as almost everyone else. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, we're using, uh, currently we're using Argo workflow and we've been using it for quite a while. Uh, 
it's, it's good, by the way, for some purposes, but still wants it to consider other potential solutions and compare it practically with Prefect and Airflow. So what I found out is they are more or less okay, all three of them. Uh, if you choose one solution over the other, you won't lose much. But there are slight variations, slight differences, uh, which impacted our final decision. So about Perfect, Perfect is just perfect for local development. I mean, it's the best of the bunch for that, uh, but it also have, um, has quite immature Kubernetes support. I'm not sure it even has one. So hard pass for us, we haven't even looked at uh, this specific decision. Ergo workflow is bulletproof. It requires very little maintenance, at least in our case. We don't do anything with it, and it just works stable uh, all the time. Uh, but there, uh, but its UI is atrocious. If someone used uh, Argo workflow, uh, they may may not agree with me. But UI is horrible. Uh, the performance of UI is even worse, and there are certain problems with running, rerunning older older workflows with that. So we're looking at Airflow, and Airflow feature-wise does everything we needed to. Uh, it's relatively performant and it's extremely mature. Uh, it's also quite widely adopted across the industry. Uh, it's very widely adopted across the industry, which means that all the issues that we are going to run into um, are going to be answered by someone else before us. So for me, uh, that's a great benefit because we don't want to run into anything new uh, without um, the specific need. So we have chosen Airflow and moving on. Uh, we've started the project from uh, prototype, and this prototype is being run by the cloud. Finally, for those of you who have been waiting, uh, we used Amazon EMR, uh, just basically deployed an EMR cluster and created several buckets in Amazon S3 uh, to achieve uh, feature parity with, with the picture we initially painted. So we did it uh, first to present uh, our colleagues uh, the fi final vision and to test how different uh, components of our stack are going to be integrated, interoperate with each other. So with EMR, we are getting Spark and Zeppelin right away out of the box. Uh, and immediately after deployment, uh, they're ready to connect to S3 or any relational database or any other data source. Uh, so we were free to do all the R&D we needed. Uh, for that, uh, we tested different data formats and compression codecs. And we are moving to compression uh, data formats first. Yeah, um, Safe choice would be a Parquet. Uh, a lot of people are using Parquet. It's a great columnar format. Uh, it's good. Uh, it's, uh, say it's a safe choice, but still wants it to look at what the market has to offer currently. And there are three modern data formats that are supposed to increase uh, Parquet's uh, feature set in several directions, most of them is uh, support for transactions and uh, emerge operation. So we see Delta, Iceberg, and Hoodie. We've tested all of them, and they turned out to be very similar in terms of features, at least in terms of promised features, according to the website of their respective developers. Um, but what the difference is, especially uh, from the high level, is total lack of uh, support of merge and read for Delta. It only supports uh, copy and write. What it means is that Delta, uh, unlike Hoodie and uh, Iceberg, does not allow for trade-off, uh, potentially at least, between faster writes and faster reads. Uh, copy on write means that uh, it reads faster, but writes are going to be usually slower than in other formats that allow for this specific trade-off. But for mostly read workloads, it's going to be quite okay. Uh, Iceberg is supposedly the most advanced of the bunch but it was the most unstable, or the least stable, if I may say so. Uh, it's the only format that we had real problems with, uh, with even running the format. It's the least well documented. Uh, mm, it wasn't a pleasure to work with it at all. And it also was uh, the least performant. A different difference was much, uh, but it was still slower than both Delta and Hoosie, uh, using the same, of course, mode uh, to compare only copy and write. Uh, Hoodie, what I can say about Hoodie, Hoodie is better than Iceberg, uh, but still wasn't documented well, um, still isn't good as Delta. Delta is the best of them, at least according uh, to the features we've been discussing, because it's the most mature solution, is the best documented, and it just works out of the box. I mean, it was the easiest format to implement in our data lake, uh, at least in prototype phase. It just works, it does everything other formats do, so we have chosen this format and that's it. Uh, the only potential downside, um, some people say, again, that heavily depends on the data you, you're using, because I would advise uh, to look at your own data, 
and compare all the compression codecs and formats for your use cases. But still, data, uh, Delta files are typically a little bit bigger uh, We're using the same compression codecs compared to Hoosie and Iceberg. Okay, moving to compression codecs. And by the way, you're going to see two pictures uh, uh, here on this slide and the next. Uh, if you want any more concrete data about compression codex comparison, uh, feel free to contact me after the presentation. I will give you more because we had lots more data and lots more codecs than whatever you can see here. Uh, because some of them, for example, Bzip provided uh, a quite stark difference with the rest and it was all skewed. So continue on. If you only care about uh, throughput of write and read and you only care about uh, compression rate, uh, you only have to look at the standard and LZ4. Everything else is notable at all. Uh, the standard uh, compresses close to BZIP2, so it's very good at compression, and achieves throughput comparable to that of a Snappy. So that's very fast, and that compresses greatly. Uh, when I looked at the compression levels, because each of these codecs supposedly provides several different compression levels, it turned out the default was usually enough because difference from higher compression levels of the same codecs didn't, prov didn't provide uh, a lot of uh, uh, um, inc improvement in compression rate by decreased throughput greatly. So we don't want that, and I'm just skipping this, uh, that topic completely. And what about LZ4? Well, LZ4 uh, doesn't compress data as good as Z standard, of course. Um, it's comparable to uh, Snappy in terms of compression ratio, but it is super fast. If you look at this picture, the compression speeds, the blue column is LZ4. So for certain purposes, LZ4 is going to just murder everything else. Um, finally, we have decided to use both of these codecs uh, for different layers. Uh, because for example, for source layer, uh, basically all the incoming data, uh, we mm -hmm. would like to achieve uh, more compression rate uh, to save space. But for, s s for consequent layers, uh, which for example hold aggregate data or smaller data sets, uh, we don't want to compress the data as much, but we'd like the fastest compression, the compression speed we can achieve. So for them, LZ4 would do just fine. So, uh, moving on to the final stage, where we're currently at. Uh, at this point, we've got a temporary production cluster. Uh, by temporary in production, I mean that it's supposed to be production, but it's not the final hardware, because the final hardware is on the way. We are going to migrate to it as soon as it's uh, fully implemented. Uh, but so far, it's our prod. We've implemented all the features and all of the components that I've talked to you uh, before, and some that I haven't discussed at all, for example, Apache Zeppelin and Kubiflow, uh, they're all working, uh, they're there. We've implemented several of the pipelines, so the data is being loaded to our MinIO already, and we are migrating some of the workflows to the cluster. So that's where we are, and thanks for the attention. If you've got any questions, I'm open to them. So my question is, uh, why not use uh, ClickHouse in uh, your system? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay, you can hear me, that's fine. Uh, you know, um, some people would like to uh, use ClickHouse for everything. Maybe yep. ClickHouse even uh, can even uh, can even do my functions, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, in my mind, ClickHouse uh, does more to work as the center of the data, data solution of the data lake. I mean, it's, it's, it's good for some decisions. Again, aggregate speed is insane. It's great for that. But for a lot of other tasks, it's not working as well. I mean, MinIO has its uh, benefits. And again, we're decoupling uh, compute from storage. And for example, with MinIO, you can connect with almost everything. S3 is a de facto standard, basically, at this point. Everything is moving to it. So um, I'm not sure ClickHouse is comparable in terms of the feature set. Uh, ClickHouse is comparable with S3 with uh, um, table engine uh, S3 for that. Uh, in theory, it's comparable, but we've been looking at ClickHouse. Especially, okay, I've looked at ClickHouse at different installations, and it's not as good as people say it is. I mean, again, for some functions it's great, uh, but from what I've seen uh, in terms of different uh, tasks that we want from our data lake, mm, it doesn't uh, support all the features as well. I see. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Your presentation was very interesting, and I'm really curious how many people and how much time you spend on the whole of those, like experimentation, documentation, uh, MVP. Just curious how much time would it take to do something like that for you? And also, why I'm asking you, 
you explained really detailized in many points and like you compilate all of those knowledge and I'm curious how many people was working on it. Okay, for that one I have to think because the project was uh, not, you know, we take this many people, um, this, much, this much time, and average, we're done average, at the end. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to think a little, but uh, okay, so basically the first prototype uh, on, on the cloud was very fast. So basically several weeks and uh, two developers, one architect. Uh, so that's it. So it was easy. Uh, the second stage when we've tried, started implementing different features, especially Spark and Zeppelin, well, these haven't been as straightforward. Um, first, it's been the same two engineers and one architect for some higher concept stuff. Then we added uh, the third engineer and the fourth engineer. I believe uh, it's just four engineers currently, uh, and it took more than half a year. Uh, most of this uh, with just two engineers. A maintenance person for now, like when you have all of those set up already. Yeah, that's an interesting question because for now uh, it's our team, a data platform team, basically data engineers, uh, that are doing the maintenance. But some of the features are going to be supported by our other teams because we have different teams, for example, PaaS uh, and SRE teams. So they will do uh, some part of the support of the systems we're building. What is the role of separation between these systems? Like you use Vertica for data warehouse and use manual for data lakes and how data flow in between them and what is the volume of data, like terabytes, petabytes? Uh, can you share some metrics about them? Uh, sure, uh, about the volume of data, uh, Vertica has no more than 30 terabytes of data and our min IO uh, is going to be uh, about 500 terabytes. So not petabytes here, but 500 terabytes of data for min IO. Uh, I forgot to tell you about this. I mean, it was part of the presentation, but I totally forgot that we're still retaining the Vertica. So everything that I was showing you on the previous first slide about our existing architecture is still going to be there. So we're still leaving Vertica as is for aggregates, because again, uh, for a lot of cases, for a lot of data, it doesn't make any sense to just load it to Vertica, not because of the cost reasons and because just why. For aggregates, uh, you are completely correct. We're using Vertica and we mostly complete continue to use it uh, but for everything else, we're going to use Spark. We're also looking, by the way, at other computational engines because uh, our approach they have chosen, using Kubernetes for everything, allows to load different workloads on the same cluster. So we can easily uh, switch Spark for a Spark of different version or for something else actually on the fly. So that's good. Uh, and for example, which data are you sending currently to, uh, to S3? I mean trading or some click stream from the website, from mobile apps or, or what? Currently, we're putting the same data that we're putting to Vertica. So at this point, we haven't started, but uh, it's supposed to hold everything. So basically, all everything that you've named is going to be in our Mineo. And once again, you use Kafka as a buffer between, I mean, mobile apps, uh, trading system, etc. So first, the data is written, is written to Kafka, and then you write it to S3, right? Or directly? Uh, for, for a lot of cases, uh, we're reading data from Kafka using Kafka Connect. Uh, the guys that uh, made presentation before me, yeah, here they are. Yeah, the authors of this uh, in-house tool, I named it there. Uh, for some cases, we're using uh, other sources because um, for a lot of cases, we're just taking the data from API or from other relational databases, so basically just our own in-house tools. And the data marts which you are building within the data lake, you are building building with Spark, right? I mean, some aggregations when, yeah, so for example, when you are sending some uh, trade records and you want to build uh, the latest state of the order of each trade order, you make it on Spark, on Spark, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. Thank you.